Okay, so first, uh, who am I? Well, I'm Mark Bates. I'm the lead developer of the Mac framework. Um, and those of you who uh, went to Greg's talk this morning about scaling Ruby, you also know that I'm a rock star. Um, well, yeah. That, that's, about, that's about as close as I get to being a rock star, I guess. Um, anyway, so you know, I went to the, presenta uh, the, the presenter's talk last night that Jim gave, and uh, you know, we talked about slides and, and, and doing all sorts of cool stuff with your slides and putting really interesting pictures in there. Um, but when you're talking about building distributed applications, there's not a whole hell of a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, so I figured I would jump the gun and beat most people to the punch um, by simply putting, a, oops, simply putting a picture of a good old Darth Vader up there for you. Has absolutely nothing to do with the presentation, but I figure somebody's got to do it at, at the conference, so I figured I might as well. Okay, so what are we going to talk about when we're going to talk about uh, distributed programming? I've stolen a couple bullet points here from Wikipedia, um, but basically we're going to talk about uh, n number of applications running on n numbers of servers, all communicating together over a network, and easily and transparently connecting their resources and data with one another. So now, why distributed programming? Has anybody done any distributed programming in here? OK, so some of you. So some of this might be a bit of a repeat, uh, and you might find something, out, something cool that's new in there. And those of you who haven't, this is a good introduction to it all. Uh, so the company I was working for, a company called Helium.com, had some real scalability issues. We were running Rails and uh, run into some issues. And I'm not going to go into the whole can Rails scale, can, can it. Go to Rails Envy uh, site for that, and there's plenty of, plenty of stuff about that. But we ran into a couple issues. Like I said, scalability was our first issue. Um, we, we, we found that we had parts of our app that were very, very, very heavy uh, and took a lot of resources to run, and parts of our apps that weren't very heavy, like the registration page, uh, didn't need a lot of resources to run. But because we had this giant kind of monolithic Rails app, uh, you know, one was consuming the resources the other one desperately needed. The other problem we were having uh, was ease of development. We, our development cycles are getting really long and uh, really difficult to maintain. The reason being is, again, we have this giant monolithic enterprise-level Rails application. Uh, and if you wanted to make a change in one particular file, it kind of rippled through the whole thing in that you had to do a lot of regression testing, you had to make sure your tests were passing, and you had to navigate through this rather extensive code base. So that's when we kind of turned to distributed programming and as a way to solve these three problems. So first, we took the issue of scalability. Well, if we had uh, several applications as opposed to just one application, we could run, that, you know, run the heavier applications, run more instances of those on their own boxes, and run the lighter applications on their own boxes. So we had, like, again, the registration page is a very good example of a light application. You don't need 50 mongrels running a registration system. You need two or three, because unless you have an extremely high traffic site that's picking up you know, millions and millions of users a day, we didn't. We only had you know, uh, five or 6,000 users a day registering. That wasn't what the main part of our application was. We didn't need a lot of uh, resources for it. However, our rating engine was extremely complicated, took a lot of resources, um, and we really needed to push that off into its own series of boxes, uh, not just one. And we didn't want anybody hitting it through the registration page and using up those valuable resources. Um, and then, like I said, ease of development. So now we ended up with you know, a, a half a dozen to a dozen mini applications, all of them easier to develop and all of them easier to maintain because of that. Um, you know, again, we, could, we had long pole projects, we had short pole projects. Our long pole projects were anywhere up to 12 weeks. Not very agile, I know. Uh, and our short pole projects were much more agile. They were up to anywhere up to two weeks. Um, but because we had one big, one big application, the team would start working on these long pole projects. We'd have these short pole projects to fill in some gaps in there. And those would have to sit there for 12 weeks before they get to QA and then before they would get out to production. Um, by having a bunch of smaller applications, we were able to say, OK, we're going to have a long pole project here. We're going to create a new application, or we're going to update an existing application. And then uh, we're going to have some short pole projects over here. So we're going to make big revisions to the, the rating engine, but we're going to add you know, address information to the registration page. We can get that out really quick while the rating engine is doing what it does. Uh, so that also helps our quicker re release cycles, our quicker QA cycles. So now the question you have to ask yourself is, OK, we understand why we need, DR we, why we need distributed programming. The question is, what does Ruby offer uh, to let us do that? How is, how is Ruby going to help us in this? And uh, the first thing Ruby gives us is a system called DRB. This is in the standard library. It's there when you install Ruby. Uh, it's very, very nice. And the basic idea behind, between DRB is you have two processes. 
process one, process two, and they connect together over an IP address and a port. Process two, you know, process one is our server. It fires up, it binds itself to that address, binds itself to that port. It says, I'm offering a service here. Come and use me. Process two says, okay, I want that service. I'm gonna connect uh, using DRB to that IP address and that port, and I'm gonna get that, get that service. Let's look at a bit of code here. So here's what our server looks like. I, I hope those of you in the back can read that. Um, we're gonna do a very simple logging server. All right, so we're gonna create a new instance of the logger, of a logging class that's just gonna go to standard out. Uh, then we're gonna start the DRB service. And again, like I said we're gonna bind to that particular IP address and that particular port. You can obviously use any IP address, any port you want. And we're gonna give it the instance of the logger that we've created. So now we're saying, okay, let's share that logger on that IP address, on that port for anybody to come along. And at the very end of it, we're gonna join the thread so that the server doesn't stop on us. Um, okay, and our client code is very, very simple. We're going to uh, get the DRB logger from, uh, from that particular IP address and that port, and then we're gonna call info off it as if it was a regular instance of the logger running locally, and we're gonna pass in our first, first argument. And here's a, here's a brief little demonstration of what that looks like, if it'll, if it'll advance to the next slide, right? Oops, there we go. So again, we're starting our server. We run our client, we say hello and voila, it sends it over. Has anybody ever used uh, RMI in Java? Anybody? Great. Can you do it in as little as lines as code as this? No. <laughs> Would you want to use RMI again? Probably not. <laughs> uh, and I think that, that demonstrates why you don't want to use RMI again and why DRB is so nice. There are problems, however, with DRB. Uh, one of them, as we saw, if we go back to our, to our code here, this is our client code. We have to know exactly where that service is. We have to know what IP address and what port it's on. And I know you're saying, okay, that's great. We can use a configuration system and we can configure it and voila, we, you don't, we don't have to touch our code if the service changes. However, what if that server falls? That server falls down and another service pops up in its place and it's now on a different port or on a different IP address. Well, a, you know, no amount of configuration is really gonna help that unless we have you know, array after array of array of you know, here's one port and if it's not there, try this one, try this one. And that's not really gonna help us very much. So that's where Rinda comes in. Uh, is anybody here familiar with, with Linda as a, as a Unix system? Okay, <laughs> two people. I think we had this conversation last night. <laughs> here's, basically, here's the basic premise behind Rinda. We had a third server into the mix, what's called a ring server. And process one and process two both connect to the ring server and say, here I am, here's where you can find me. So if anybody else needs my logging service, you know, they, they can come to the ring server and find it. Uh, and the nice thing about Rinda is you don't even need to know where the ring server is. The ring server broadcasts itself out to your network and all the processes come along, register themselves with that and also look it up. So here's a brief example, let's look at some code here. Let's look at our, our logging code again, this time rewritten in, in, uh, in Rinda. First thing we need is a ring server, and a ring server is very simple, very easy to use. Um, you see we start the DRB service, but this time we're not giving it an IP address or a port, and we create a new, Rinda, uh, new ring server and we give it a tuple space. And a tuple space is basically, think about it like a giant whiteboard or a big cork board. You know, you kind of put it up there and people can come along and they can kind of pin their services to it and another guy can come along and he can kind of take that service off of it. So it's just a centralized uh, storage space. And again, we, we, we join the thread uh, so that the ring server doesn't stop. So now this is our rewritten logging server using Rinda. Uh, again, we start the service without an IP address. We find the, the, ring, the ring server that we want, and we're gonna write to it. We're gonna write to it basically a simple array, and we're gonna give it a namespace. We're gonna call our namespace rubyconf, and we're gonna call our service DRB logger, and we're gonna give it the instance of, uh, of the logger. Now, this is actually a very important thing to note here. You have to give it an instance. You can't just give it a class. Um, so you always have to give something an instance. And uh, I'll show you some ways to get around that in a little bit because that definitely causes some problems when what you really want to share is class level, uh, types, meth class level type of methods and, and what have you. Uh, then we give it a little name, a little descriptive text there, my distributed logger, and uh, a renewer. And I'm not going to go into renewers. They're a bit of a, an interesting subject, um, but certainly will take us over our 45 minutes here. Um, and then, uh, then again, we're going to join the thread back up. So our client, again, our, our client's a little different. We're gonna start the service, um, and all that's basically doing in the client side is saying, we're gonna be using some DRB stuff, so set it up for me. 
can find the ring server. Then off that ring server, we're going to try to find uh, under the RubyConf namespace the DRB logger system, and we're going to pass nil nil in for the last two arguments because they're wild cards. We don't care what the description is. If we really wanted to narrow it down to a very specific DRB logger, we could obviously put the description in there, and that would help narrow that down. Then once we get our DRB logger, we're going to call info off it, and Bob's your uncle. It'll work. So here we'll see. We'll start the uh, the ring server. Nothing too exciting there. We'll start our client, our server up again, this time with Rinda. And we'll fire up our client to say hello. There we go. Says hello. Uh, all very exciting and very easy to use. So now let's talk about a little, just very quickly, you know, I said that it's a place you can go and you can post services and others can come along and, and find those services. Well, here's a little class that all it does is, uh, is list the services for you so you can see which you know, let's see what services are out there. It's, it's useful when, you know, when you're in production, you just want to make sure something's running, see where it is. It's good in development for the same reason, but here I'll give you a brief example of, of what that would actually do. Here we go, we list our services. You can see the RubyConf uh, DRB logger, and it's on this really, really nice address at port 55658 in its description. So we know that it, we know that it is running. Okay, so proxies. So now we've, we've passed a very simple class and we passed a logging class in. Uh, DRB and Rinda allow you to pass proxies back and forth for complex objects. Uh, in particular, one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to pass in standard out and standard in from the client to the server. Um, and because we want, it, we want the server to be able to say, okay, what's your name? Let the client respond with its name and then give back, print back a message to the output uh, of the client. So if we take a look here at what our server is going to look like, I'll actually zoom in here. Uh, in particular, this is the method that's, that's of most importance to us. Okay, this hello method is going to take an in stream and an out stream, and we're going to say we're going to ask for the name uh, on the output stream. On the input, we're going to get the name back from the input stream, and we're going to send, uh, send hello back on the output stream. And our client, again, very simple. We're going to get the hello service from, uh, from Rinda. And we're going to call the hello method off it, passing in the standard in and standard out. And uh, if we run that, I hope people can see these examples in the back. All right, so Ruby client, what is your name? Well, my name is Mark Bates. Not very exciting, but hello, Mark Bates. Uh, so that's a, that's a way of pass, like I said, we're passing across input and output streams, which is, a, which is a really wonderful thing to do. But now we have a problem. We've passed the proxy along of our input and output stream. We've passed logging uh, along, and we could pass, obviously, any other Ruby class we want to pass along, or any Ruby object, rather, we want to pass along. We have a problem, however, that so far what we've been doing is we've been passing along objects that both VMs know about. They both have the class definitions for logging. They both have the class definitions for inputs and outputs streams. Uh, what they don't have is a specialized class. So our server is going to have a specialized class that we want to pass to our client how do we do that? Well, let's take a look. We have this routes class, this really poor routes class, and all it has is a foo method on it. And uh, someone just called me, and uh, it's going to return back foo dash remote. So that's very simple. If we look at our, our complex proxy, proxy service here, we have a get routes method down the bottom that uh, is going to return an instance of that routes class, and we bind the complex per proxy service to Rinda. And uh, we want to be able to get that from our client. So with our client code here, all, again, all the same until we get down to the very bottom line, we get, the, we get the complex proxy service. We want to get the routes method off of it. And off of that, we want to call the foo class, the foo method. However, when we try to run this, remember the client doesn't have access to the routes class definition. So we get this, undefined method foo for DRB unknown. So how do we get past that? Because let's be honest, passing strings and arrays and hashes and logging is, is well and good, but in a real application, we're not really going to be able to do a whole hell of a lot with that. Well, I mean, we're going to be, we could do a whole hell of a lot with it, but we want to get a little more exciting, a little more interesting. So if we revisit our routes class, the way we solve that problem is by including DRB undumped. And when we do that, it's actually going to send a proxy class definition down to the client that the client can then make calls off of, and they got proxied back to the server to be run. Um, it all sounds like magic, and it is a little bit, uh, but it's, it's very exciting. So if we rerun that, uh, that same example again, this time with our include DRB and dumped in there, 
You can see this time in the server, we see someone just called me, and in our, in our client, we see foo dash remote. So uh, that's how we get around the DRB undumped. So now the question you must be asking yourself is, this is great, how do I do something really cool with this? How do I really make an application run with this and not have to deal with all this kind of looking up and reading and, and configuring? Well, the answer to that is the Mac framework. And uh, this is something I started writing at Helium back in March. It's at 0 0.8.1. And one of the big goals of it is to really ease the use of building distributed applications. It's primarily geared towards web applications, but you could very easily run it uh, as a background application as well. And Mac allows you to do three uh, very simple things. One, it allows you to share any object you want. Um, any object, any class you want, as a matter of fact, not just any object, but any class. It allows you to share your routing information. So those, I imagine, who use Rails and Merb uh, or any of the other web frameworks know what I'm talking about when, I share, when I'm talking about routing. Um, and I'll talk about why it's important to be able to share routes when you're dealing with distributed uh, applications in a minute. And the last thing it gives you is the ability to share your views and your layouts. Now, all three of these things were things that we had problems with at Helium. So we decided we wanted to build these mini applications, as I said. And the first thing we want to do is say, okay, we have our registration app that's going to have our user object. Well, the rest of our applications need to have access to user object in one way, shape, or form, right? And we need to be able to call class methods off that. So we said, okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two we had is our views and layouts. With multiple applications, I'm sure everybody here has run multiple applications, do you want to look the same? That's a bit of a problem, especially, uh, especially in something like Rails. There's no really good way to do it. You can't really use a plugin. You can't really use a gem uh, to do that. So you're, you're stuck with either NFS mounts, um, which have their own problems, obviously. You're also stuck with co you know, copy-paste or R-syncing you know, from your libraries, doing some sort of Git sub-modules uh, to do it. And the solution we came up with was having a, a Mac, Mac application that just did nothing but serve up views and layouts um, using the distributed views and layouts features of Mac, which I'll show you. And then the third thing we had was routing. And uh, why, why this was a problem was because we have our registration app and our rating app. Actually, that's a bad example. Let's say we have a user uh, management application and an article application, two applications we had. So user management, they could go in and they could you know, do the user updates, edit profiles. They could also get a list of the articles that they've written. Now, we want to be able to have those users click on that article and get taken to the article page, which is in the article application, a completely separate application. So we could either duplicate the entire routing stack from each of our applications in each of our applications. Um, we could hard code those routes. We could say, OK, we know that it's slash articles slash ID, so we're going to hard code that in there, but God help us if articles ever changes its, its address. And the third thing is we, wanted, we also didn't know if it was even going to be on the same host, because it could be articles.helium.com and users.helium.com. And so we'd have to know that as well. So now you get into this whole configuration nightmare. Uh, and Mac very simply and cleanly uh, wraps that up for you. So let's take a little bit, a quick look at some of the code and see, see how Mac is going to help us. Uh, the first thing we need to do is actually add the Mac distributed package to any Mac application. Um, very simple. In your config uh, initializer's gems file, you add gem add Mac distributed. And now you've got access to all the Mac distributed stuff. Next thing we need to do is is add these five lines of configuration. This honestly and truly is the all the configuration you actually need to do to get your Mac application up and running. You give it an app name, and that's going to be what we were using as RubyConf earlier. Um, so in this case, we're going to build a quick news application. And that's going to be our top level namespace. So all of our services are for, this, uh, for this application are going to run underneath it. We're going to give it a site domain. And the reason we do that is for our routing, because again, we don't know where this application is actually. We, don't know, we know that it might be news.example.com, but we don't know that when we're in users.example.com. Um, and so we can't rely that it's on users.example.com. So this will give us a fully qualified URL. It's, it's not the most perfect solution, but it's a solution. Uh, and then the last three is where we turn on the three things that we can share. You want to share your views, your objects, and your routes. So the answers to these things is all true. In this particular case, you don't have to use all of them. But you do, but once you do that, your app fires up. It's going to start registering all your views, all your layouts with Rinda. It's going to register uh, your, your objects that you tell it to register, and I'll show you that in a minute. And finally, it's going to register your routing uh, with, with the Ring server. So if we look at our routes, our routes are very simple here. We haven't done anything special to our routing. 
Um, we've got a resource called News Items, and Mac routing is very similar to Rails routing, and it's very similar to uh, Merb's previous router before they went and changed it like two weeks ago, um, except it's a little more powerful than, uh, than the Rails router. Simple little plug there. Anyway, then we have our news item model. In this case, we're using data mapper. It could be active record. It could not be a database back model. It could be whatever you want. But the thing I want to draw your, line, your attention to is include Mac distributable. That's all we need to do to get this object to register itself with Rinda. So now you can, you know, the clients have, now have access to this news item model at the class level. And I'll show you that because I think it's, that's, that's really cool. Because um, again, you can't do that basic. On our client side, all we need to do to get our client to be able to work is to add, uh, is to add the Mac distributed package to our clients. That's it. That's all you need to do. That also means the client can now become a server. Um, on Mac, it's an end-to-end -end relationship, or end to m relationship, however you want to do it, many-to-many. -many. Um, so anything can be a server, anything can be a client. So now let's take a quick peek here. We fired up the top is our server and the bottom is our console. And first thing we're going to do is we want to try and get that news item from the server. So here we're going to say, OK, Mac distributed news item dot all. There is no new news item in our client application. There's no package called Mac distributed. Um, but, instead, but we are calling Mac distributed news item, and then we're calling a class method off of that news item. This is where Mac gets really cool, because anything you call in the Mac distributed package, if it doesn't have that class, it'll actually go to Rinda and find the first instance of that service running for you. So now I know you're probably saying, OK, what if I had two news items and two different services? Uh, you can, there's a retrieve method that allows you to ask for a very specific one. But some would also argue that's probably poor planning on your part if you have objects that are named the exact same thing. Um, so OK, so what happens when we actually run dot all off of it? Well, there we go. You can see the server. It called select. It basically selected all of our news items off of our server. And down on our bottom here, it gave us a nice big uh, stack, you know, nice big uh, inspect. And the inspect actually gives you the DRB inspect as well as the inspect of the actual uh, model itself. So there we go. So we've called the class level method off of uh, an object that we don't even have. And we've done it by adding one line of code in our client and a couple configurations in our, in our server. So now off of that, we can, uh, we can get you know, the very first uh, news item object, as we will do here. I slow typing. We've printed it out. We're going to print off the title of it. And remember, in, we're interacting with this as if it was a local object. And you can see the server is doing all of our database work for us. Uh, so the client isn't doing any of this database work, which is, which is really nice, again, if you're trying to offload that processing. Um, we can do, you know, we'll, we'll, here we'll update the title and uh, send that back to the server to save it back to the database. So we'll say, hi there, RubyConf, which is great. We save it. And again, you see it does the update in the very top of the screen. Um, again, this is really easy to use. And, and I'll tell you, programming, we've been programming this for, for you know, months now. And it is just, it's really fun to program with um, and, and, and to use. OK. So if we take a look at our controller on our client side, so we're going to build a, a little page that just lists out our, our news items uh, very simply in our, in our client. And then we're going to link them back to the news application itself. The two things in particular you want to look at is this layout line where we're saying, OK, we want to use a distributed layout from the news application, or from the news app, and we're going to use the application layout. So when the layout gets registered uh, with Rinda, it uses the name of that file as, as, its, uh, as its registration. So application.html.erb becomes application. So it's a very simple URI pattern. Everybody's familiar with it. That's why we decided to go with it. Very clearly says you're looking for distributed, gives you the host, and gives you the service you want off of that. Then in our index action, again, we're doing that news item dot all. Um, that's it. We're assigning it to an instance variable. It's, it's uh, ready to go. In our view here, we're going to zoom in a little bit here in our view, and we're going to show you what a distributed route looks like. Um, so here we go. So we're saying a distributed URL, and we want to get that off of the news application, the news app. And the URL we want is news items show URL. And, we're, and that, that URL takes um, some parameters, so we can give it an optional hash at the end. And that's actually going to build our link back to the news item. So here's what our, uh, our server looks like. You can see it's not very exciting. And, uh, but it's got, you know, it's got a nice layout on it. It's got printed a bunch of stuff. Now if we go to our client, 
right? This is the client we've just built. You can see we've got the distributed layout the t around the top of it. I came from the news app. Then you can see we have the client app in the middle, and then a couple links that we've built back to the main application. And if we actually click those links, you see it goes from port 4,000 to port 3,000 and takes us to uh, the news item. What's really nice now is if the news item URL changes under the covers, we can actually just, we don't have to do anything to our client application now. So if the news item, you know, they decide that the news item is no longer going to be slash news item slash one, it's going to be slash article slash one, um, the server changes that, it re-registers its routes back to Rinda, our client application remains unchanged. The big, you know, the big thing there is you just obviously don't change the, the name of your named route. <laughs> if you change the name of your named route, then you're going to have to uh, go through and change that. Um, so that's it. It's a, it's a little, I thought I would open this up for questions because um, there's a lot kind of going on here and obviously I can show you some more. Um, but that's it. Are there, are there questions? There must be, yes. Define what you mean when you say it's for portal-like applications because I've seen that a couple of times. I'm just really not sure exactly where you're coming from when you say that. What I say, uh, define what I mean when I talk about portal-like applications? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So portal-like applications, uh, the way I, I've always seen them, are applications that contain other mini applications. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think it was the original goal of Rails components to do something like that. And I think it's kind of the goal of Merb slices. Um, I don't think either of them really gets, gets you where you need to be. Um, Mac has a new feature that came out in 081, I think, called portlets. And portlets allow you to build, and it's another way of kind of distributing your code, actually, so it actually kind of works in well with the whole talk here. Um, portlets allow you to build a Mac application, a regular Mac application. It's standalone. You can fire it up. You can test it. There is zero, zero, uh, zero uh, specialness about this application. Um, when you're done with it and you want to distribute that application, you run a rake task. It builds a gem for you. And you can distribute that gem and include it into your other Mac applications. In that gem, though, it also bundles up not only your controller code and your model code and your lib code, it, it'll package up your plugins, your, the gems you, that you're requiring, your assets, so all your images, uh, your views, your layouts, your JavaScript files, your PDFs, your media, uh, your routing, your configurations. They all get bundled in together for you, and you don't have to do a damn thing. You plug it into your next Mac application. It has it. If you don't like, you know, there's one that uh, you can find on my GitHub page, which I sh probably should have put up here. Uh, you can get to it through the MacFramework.com. But I'm working on one called User Auth Portlet, um, which is, you know, basic, uh, you know, RESTful authentication like, like, uh, pl like, like Gem. And if you, you know, you plug it in, and you don't have to do any running generators or unpack the Gem if you, you know, if you don't want to. Um, you start it up, and boom, you have registration. You have user management. People can edit their passwords, upload a photo of themselves what have you. It's all there, ready to go. And if you don't like the registration page, well, you just simply override that one view. And so it always looks locally and then kind of goes, goes through your portlets. Um, so that's what I when I talk about portlet-like applications. I mean being able to bundle up applications into mini applications and then either embed them uh, into your applications or be able to access them through other applications. And one of the features Mac has is a render URL uh, method. So you can render text, render action, render all those sorts of things. You can also do render URL. And if it's a local URL, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't contain a scheme, uh, a scheme or a host, it'll actually do a call internally um, and render, that, render whatever that action is into that page or wherever you're rendering it. Um, and if an external one, it'll actually do a call out and come back in. So it's very easy to, 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 to write portlets, uh, to, to work with other applications um, and, and, and bring them back in. So does that answer your question? Great, great. Other questions? In the back, yes. Have you considered porting this to other frameworks, porting specifically the distributed uh, object portion to the wrappers around Rinda to other frameworks like Merv and Rails? And is that even possible? Uh, so have I, have I thought of, um, of porting the Mac distributed package to other frameworks like Rails and Merv? Um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> like I said, we started on Rails, and I was, uh, we were hoping to stay on Rails because uh, that's what our framework, that's what we were using. Um, and the Rails system under the covers and Rails code under the covers is extremely complicated. Um, we could definitely port some of this, um, certainly you know, probably two-thirds of it. The routing aspects, I think, would cause the most problems. Um, it'd be easier to do in Merb because their API is a lot cleaner. Um, and at the time when we were looking to do something, I wasn't originally looking to build a framework. It just kind of happened. And uh, Merb was definitely on that short list originally, but it was a much different framework then than it is today. This was back in February. Um, so it could be ported. And I have thought about it, yeah. But uh, 
right now, obviously, uh, I'm a big fan of Mac, so <laughs> got to give it some edge, right? Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Great. Yes? So let's say you have a database server and an app server, mm -hmm. and for now, they both know about the object. Right. So when you send a request over the database server, it gets run there. Now let's say they don't both, don't, don't both know. But, so you get a, so you're using a proxy object. Right. That means when you perform a computation over here, the data has to come across to be processed. Correct. Right. Do you know of anything <laughs> where this guy doesn't know about that object, but somehow gets magically shipped the code so that the, all the processing occurs on that side, even though you start out with a proxy? Okay, so the question, if I understand it, is you have a, a server and a client. Um, the server has, has, a, has, a, has a, spe a specific uh, uh, class in it, and the client doesn't. And you want to know, is there a way that uh, the client can actually get that full class definition so it can run it locally versus run it on the, the server? Um, the answer to that off the top of my head, is, well, off of the experience I've had when I originally started building this was no. Um, and uh, at the very first implementation of the, the route of the distributed routes for Mac was uh, was definitely a hack, and uh, because I you know I couldn't I didn't find the DRB undumped thing until like the next release, um, which helped solve a lot of that problems. But it was basically to package up a string, send it down the pipe, eval it into the class, and then then you have the class definition local. It's not the best. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly not the best approach. And I hope I hope somebody comes up with a better approach. Definitely. Definitely. Does that answer? Thank you. Awesome. Great. Questions? No one has any questions about distributed programming? You? Yes. So uh, is there a way to actually make the Linda server more fault tolerant, meaning like have a redundant set of copies? Because as far as I know, it becomes a single point of failure in the server uh, in the distributed model. It doesn't provide that kind of a flexible reliability. And, Right. So, so is there a way to pool server kind of things and multiple servers running on different ones? Okay, so your question, if I understand it, is uh, is there a way to basically run multiple ring servers so that if one fails, and the answer is yes. <laughs> you can fire up as many ring servers as you want. Uh, they get cross-communicated. Yes, yeah. They, they, if, one, if one goes down, the other one will be able to, to, to fire up. Uh, Rinda has, uh, has uh, broadcast lists, so when you fire up, uh, your, your client in particular, in, in your client, you can say, I only want to look for my a local ring server. I want to look across my network for a ring server. And Rinda on the server side also has ACLs, so you can actually uh, block uh, different different ports, uh, allow allow different IP addresses and, and disallow different different IP addresses if you want. So there's a lot of security built in there as well. But actually, just to, uh, does that answer your question? Um, but to, 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 to go back to your point real quick, because uh, I think one of the things you brought up there was scalability. In some respects, you have, you know, you're sending a lot of data back and forth. And this is a very important thing to know about distributed programming. It only scales to a point. <laughs> and uh, I found that when I was pulling one to 10 uh, instances of, of you know, the news item across, right? So I, I pull back 10 records of the news item. One, one record, negligible. You would never notice the time it takes to, to marshal that object bring it back across the pipe and unmarshal it. 10 objects, same thing. A little, little performance hit, but you never really notice it. When I got to 100, I think I was getting to two or three times <laughs> the slowdown, simply because of all the marshaling and unmarshaling. So you've got to be judicious in your use of the distributed programming. You know, uh, great examples of this are really just, you know, if you have services, you want to send something over, just send it over, let it do its thing, and just get back a receipt. Don't try to get back this giant, enormous blob of data. And if you need giant, enormous blobs of data to come back, use memcache. <laughs> use, uh, use, a, use your database. Don't, don't just sit there and marshal the objects across, uh, across DRB because it's, it's going to slow you down. So, questions? Yes? How do you handle and loading of aggregate objects on the clock? So, say you fetch a news article and to a collection of children. <laughs> okay, so the question is, how do you deal with uh, lazy loading of, of, of objects? So you have, you know, a, a post has many comments, and those comments are, are lazy loaded. Uh, well, the answer is it's very simple. Um, it all happens for you. <laughs> it's just like any other method call, you know. So when you call, you know, you know, my, you know, my comment dot, uh, my post dot comments. It's going, to call, it's going to call that proxy object uh, that you've got, and it's going to send back to the server saying, I need 
the call the comments method on this, on this object, and it's going to do the work, and it's going to send you back the results. So in the case, if you have a, if you have a thousand comments, probably not the best architectural <laughs> choice to do that, as I just said, as far as uh, scalability is concerned. So, um, you know, or, or try to load those things all up at once, you know, and not use lazy loading in that particular case. So, you know, if you're using data mapper, it's, it's really easy to do different variants of things, depending on what you want, so. Questions? Yes? I think this is done for the coupling of your applications, because a lot of people tend to use distributed applications with many small applications to reduce coupling. And it seems like in a lot of ways you probably get these by making the application so interdependent by the internals. OK, so the question is, uh, how does this impact coupling of the applications? Um, and the answer is, uh, it impacts it it impacts it the same way, I guess, as if you didn't, if you weren't using the Mac framework. It's all about your architecture at the end of the day. Um, our applications were pretty tightly coupled, um, with the exception of some of our more service-based uh, applications. Um, you know, again, it was more, it wasn't a decoupling of the application so that, hey, I could run, you know, this one thing, run the rating engine on its own and no one never has to be any of the wiser. That wasn't the point of what we were trying to do. Uh, we were really trying to just decouple the development time as well as uh, the processing power needed to do those things. Um, but yeah, you could certainly get into a situation where they're very tightly coupled um, accidentally <laughs> with, if you're not careful about your architecture. Right. So the question is, how do you, how do you deal with testing um, it, with with applications that are distributed like this? Uh, and the answer we came up with was mocking. You know, we knew that our application, you know, a particular application needed, um, you know, needed a user object, you know, needed access to the user object or what have you. Uh, so we would just mock that out and not have to not do the remote calls. So that's, that's how we got around it. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty, I thought it was a pretty decent way of testing. We ended up building gems of all of our mocks. <laughs> you know, a very simple mock gem that just we can include into all of our applications and just have access to all those mocks that we may or may not need. So answer that question? Great. Yes? How do you uh, manage uh, for like portlets specifically, uh, like this distributed uh, migration? So you have just that separate databases for each application, but then for a portlet that's part of a larger application, do you merge those migrations together? How do you uh, that's a great question. So the question is about uh, migrations and portlets and, uh, and distributed applications somewhat, right? It's kind of a, a little there. Uh, well, to, to answer the first question, um, migrations get bundled up into portlets. Um, and they get, run the, you know, they get run in the same order as if they were local. So again, it's all about naming. You got to make sure that if you have a 001 migration in your portlet and you have a 001 migration local that uh, that, that relies on that, you might have an issue. <laughs> um, there, there is an unpack feature specifically designed so that in the case of migrations, migrations were the big one that always caused me problems. So you can unpack just the migrations if you really need to do that. Um, but we, uh, we use one, one big database primarily uh, for the application. Um, so everything was under the covers, all talking to the same database. Um, but again, you know, with portlets, you know, they rely on whatever database you have configured locally. So they don't carry their own database configuration over. Uh, so they use whatever's local. So, but migrations are there, so you can run them. Um, and if you're using one database, if you're using Active Record or Data Mapper, uh, they both have ways of preventing you know you running the same migration twice. Uh, so even if you have the same portlet, the user auth portlet in a couple apps, if you run the migrations, it's not going to re-add the user table again. So it's already going to know that migration was run and just skip it. So you yes, and then you. Is there any notification of when an object changes on another server, for instance, like if it comes dirty over there and I'm using it over here currently, do I have to go refresh it if there's a notification or something? Uh, there's no built-in notification system. Um, there is actually a notifiers package, but it's more for email and XMPP and the like. Um, there's nothing currently built in to do that now. So you'd have to, if the service has changed, uh, yeah, you'd have to ping back and say, hey, has the service changed on me? Uh, and then, then, then use that service. It all depends, again, it all depends on your architecture. Are you caching you, you, that service locally? Once you, you know, first time you get it, you kind of take it down and use it locally. The, the, the issue, that issue came up with routing, right? Because we wanted to be able to not have to bring down our client apps if our server app changed its routing. Um, so what we actually did was on each request, we cached the routing for that one request. So we can hit it n number of times within that request, and the next request comes in, we actually pull the caching down again. Um, so that was a, an architecture we chose in order to, uh, to make sure that we were getting some benefits of caching, because if you're calling 100 URLs, you know, you pointed 100 different distributed URLs, you don't want to have to get those things 100 times for that one request. However, if they change, 
you want to make sure that you're using the right ones on the next request. So there's a brief moment where someone could change something under the covers, and you get built a static, you know, an out-of-date page. But that was kind of what we did with it. Yes. Extract, or you can use just the distributed objects portion of this in a, a non-web application. Okay, so the question was, can you use the uh, distributed portions of this in a non-web application? Uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, the answer is uh, it, it uses, uh, the, the Mac distributed gem uses, uh, definitely hooks into parts of Mac. So it would have to be a Mac-based application. However, you don't have to use it as a web application. But then you get all the other good stuff that comes with a Mac application as well. So <laughs> does that answer your question? Great. Next question, I saw another hand up somewhere. Yes. If, uh, if, we, if, if we're swayed by your presentation here and think that Mac applications and Mac framework is the hottest thing ever, and we want to go home and start using it to parcel out new short old projects, uh, but we're provincial enough that we have these monolithic Rails applications as well, uh, is there an easy way to migrate to Mac, uh, Mac framework, kind of one little mini application? Uh, so the question is, uh, if you have an existing Rails application and you want to start introducing Mac applications in, is there an easy way to start migrating that Rails app one over at a, one at a time? Uh, if the if the if the answer you're looking for is there's a rake task, <laughs> then the answer is no, unfortunately. Um, but Mac and Rails are are similar enough in their structure that you could do a, you, know, you could do some cut and paste and do some tweaking um, to get that. Is can you handle that distributed nature of things between a Rails application and a Mac application? So you still have your, your monolithic Rails, uh, Rails application, but let's say you create a new Mac application from scratch, but you right. want to be able to use objects from the Rails, the Rails application. Right. Uh, the answer is that that's a very similar question. The question, again, is I want to use ob uh, objects from my Rails application in my, in my Mac application in a distributed way. Can I do that? And that, that's your question, right? OK, good. <laughs> just want to make sure I have the question right. Uh, and again, the answer is, um, is yes and no. Um, the Mac distributed package itself can't just easily be plugged into Rails um, because it relies on some Mac uh, stuff. So you won't, be, you won't have the quick right out of the gate, boom, I can use Rails and Mac interchangeably. Um, you could very easily port par portions of the Mac gem, the Mac distributed gem over to your Rails app and do that. It's certainly something I've considered doing, at least for, again, you know, two of the three parts, and particularly just the, uh, the object part. I think just being able to share do the object part would be very, very useful um, to, to people. So it's definitely something I've thought about. But you could, you could do it. It's not a whole lot of code. It's not a lot of code at all. So does that answer your question? Great. Any other questions? I don't know how we're doing for time. I think we're almost out of time anyway. So, yes. Is there any issues to use this with JRuby? Um, yes, it currently doesn't work on JRuby. I was actually working on it the other day. Um, I'm down to 20 RSpec bugs, and they, 19 of them seem to be the same thing. So, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close. And that's going to be in the next release, uh, hopefully in a few weeks. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to J, use JRuby in the next, uh, next job I'm working in. So, I definitely want to be able to use Mac. So, it's high on my priority list, definitely. Definitely. Any other questions? Well, great. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>